Thanks very much for inviting me and for uh, giving me the opportunity to be uh, back here. It's, um, it's very emotional to be here. Uh, I couldn't have imagined when I started, when I came here 18 years ago, uh, walking into the arts building, looking for the history department, uh, that this would have been uh, some kind of an outcome. Um, so my, uh, my talk today is on insularity as empire and the spatial turn, Ottoman Cyprus and the Mediterranean world, which is uh, a pretty good summary of what I work on. It's going to be divided in three parts. Um, the first one and the largest is basically my uh, work so far uh, on the idea of insularity and explaining how I conceptualize this in relation to Empire uh, and Ottoman Cyprus. Second part will be on uh, the, my uh, current project which takes a bigger Mediterranean dimension and it's a comparative spatial history of, of Cyprus uh, and Crete, so by that I mean I, I take a more sort of uh, technical, let's say, turn, um, switch and discuss uh, GIS systems and uh, what the special turn is about. And finally, I'll say a few more things about uh, future prospects uh, for research as the, the outcome, the questions that are arising um, out of what I've been doing so far. And uh, basically, I'll say a few things uh, about the, the three historical actors that led me to think about uh, insularity. Uh, the first one was the governor of Cyprus, the Muhassil Haji Abdul Bakia, towards the end of the 18th uh, century. This was a man who accumulated a fortune of 8 million kurush over nine years. To put that in perspective, that was more than half of the total annual uh, Ottoman revenues uh, for uh, 1785. Um, and this man had forced Sultan Abdul Hamid I to exclaim, quote, how could this faithless man be a governor, end quote. Uh, the second um, case is the dragoman Haji Georgakis Cornesios, who followed suit. He carried the unprecedented title of uh, representative of the province, uh, which basically implied authority over both Muslims and non-Muslims, and this was uh, rather uh, unusual for a non-Muslim. And this was a man who had caused a famine, a revolt, and was executed eventually in front of the sublime port. He had left a debt of 1.3 million kurush um, that the Muslims and non-Muslims of Cyprus were eventually responsible to pay, to repay, uh, as a result of his uh, title as uh, representative of the province. Finally, the third case is an Armenian, uh, Sarkis. He was a consular dragoman uh, for the French and later on for the English. Uh, his uh, appointment in that position uh, caused basically a diplomatic episode uh, between the Ottoman Empire uh, and um, Britain. Um, and this was a man who kept, uh, he wasn't just a dragoman, he was also a merchant. <laughs> Uh, and he kept in his warehouses three quarters of the wheat requisitioned uh, from the whole island in 1800 uh, as, um, as part of um, uh, extraordinary um, uh, taxation in kind. Uh, now, the, the issue with these three cases is that uh, they don't really fit in the bigger picture of Cyprus as an Ottoman province, which was really an average uh, province of the empire. It didn't really have anything special uh, to offer. It didn't have anything to draw uh, attention. So how was it possible for such episodes to take uh, place? <laughs> Uh, this conundrum is explicable by the combination of three factors. One, Cyprus was large and productive enough to have a sizable surplus. Two, it was contained enough as an economic space to be manipulated by commercial and financial networks. And three, it was distant enough to be perceived of in ways that allowed it to escape imperial attention. We can summarize this as big enough, small enough, and far enough. And in this uh, context, insularity, uh, that is the condition of being and being perceived as 
an island emerges as an analytical category that allows a conceptualization of space beyond the center province binary and the assumptions and the and preconceptions that this spatial configuration entails. Now I need to emphasize, I can't emphasize enough that insularity should not be taken literally, that is it's not about isolation. Uh, to speak of islands is usually to speak of difference, peculiarity and the idiosyncratic. Um, the problem with this is that the logical conclusion is some sort of exceptionalism, this constant uh, seek to find uh, uniqueness in, in, in islands. Um, however, I contend that insularity is not about islands. No island is an island, to rephrase the poet. Um, connectivity is as intrinsic to an island as is isolation. Uh, and at the same time, contextualization is equally important. Um, all these things, I mention all these things because the spatiality of islands is neither obvious nor self explanatory. Uh, the very etymology of the word uh, from the Old English word ig, meaning sea and land, implies this special relationship, special connection between land and sea. Therefore, we can think of islands as, as connectors between uh, the isle, uh, land and, and sea. Uh, in this sense, the sea is not merely an isolating element. It is concurrently a connecting one, allowing the circulation of, of people, goods, and ideas. Uh, this, however, is only true during part of the year, when weather conditions permit it, and depending on where ships and boats come from. So in this sense, time qualifies space. Um, now, after finishing my PhD, I was looking for a conceptual framework for insularity. And uh, the obvious starting point was uh, Fernand Brodel and his idea of miniature continents, the bigger Mediterranean islands that I could compare uh, to Cyprus, Sicily, Corsica, Crete, Sardinia, even the Peloponnese, which we tend to think of as a peninsula, uh, but actually today it's an island. Uh, and even uh, the Ottoman word for uh, island, Jazire, means both island and, and peninsula. Um, another conceptual framework is Spiros Azdrahas' idea of the uh, description of the Aegean archipelago as the, quote, dispersed liquid city, end quote. Uh, the alleys and streets of which were the sea lanes of ships and boats connecting the islands between them. Um, However, I wanted to go beyond a mere typology of islands. Uh, and the question in my mind was, how do islands produce particular, but not necessarily unique, forms of interaction? In this sense, the spatial turn uh, in, in, in geography uh, teaches us that there is no such a thing as a natural border, meaning that geographical features uh, can circumscribe human interactions, but not in fixed, absolute ways. And therefore, we have an interplay between the material and the mental. Um, and what really resonated with the empirical work that I had done, and open possibilities in understanding these processes, were the ideas of Henri Lefebvre uh, and his triad on the production of space. Now, Lefebvre discusses these concepts with reference to uh, urban studies and right to the city uh, movements in a very specific temporal framework, what he calls uh, late capitalism in the 1970s, so it's even later now. Uh, but I selectively employ these ideas uh, in such a way to gain insights into the production of insular space uh, within an imperial and early modern uh, setting. In what follows, I will discuss uh, these three interconnected aspects of insularity and illustrate them with examples of how they are played out by historical actors, both from above and below. So we have the perceived, the conceived, and the lived. I'll go into further details now. Uh, perceived space refers to material conditions and the interplay between geography, climate, environment, and economy. Uh, so, in Cyprus, the 16th and 17th century saw the transition not only from Venetian to Ottoman rule, but also the substitution of sugar by cotton and silk. 
Uh, this is rather interesting because we have parallels with Crete. Uh, when they transition from the Venetian to uh, Ottoman rule, we have a similar uh, economic transition from wine to olive oil. Um, these processes reflect broader Mediterranean-wide trends um, in the organization of production and the shifting patterns of world trade. Um, so let's look at these goods uh, one by one. Cereals uh, played a major role uh, in Cyprus, um, in the economy of Cyprus. Uh, however, they contracted after the 17th century and for most of the 18th century to the benefit of cotton plants and mulberry trees. This was part of the northward movement of the grain trade to the Baltic. Um, however, there is a research of uh, grain cultivation during the closing decades of the 18th century. What about sugar? There we have the westward migration uh, out of the Mediterranean, uh, first to the Atlantic island chains, uh, Madeira, Canaries, Cape Verde Islands, uh, the Azores, etc., and then to the Caribbean. And I want to draw your attention here to the fact that these cultivations are in islands. Uh, sugar cane plantations are in islands, and this is because they are cultivated, they are, they are, um, the, the labor is, is, uh, is by slaves essentially. Uh, so we have these islands within islands, as, as it is, uh, these special uh, labor uh, conditions that are no longer sustainable in the Mediterranean and they're moving away from it. Um, so this means, uh, this is something that we meet across the Mediterranean. Um, uh, in, as far as Cyprus is concerned, this means that we have a creation of a sea of smallholders. Uh, and this is because uh, cotton, which substitutes uh, sugar, can be cultivated both by uh, small and large-scale uh, production units. Therefore, this is a, a, a plant, uh, this is a good uh, cash crop that is conducive to this kind of a transition. Uh, how are these issues related to the climate and environment? Uh, well, we have, uh, first of all, deforestation. After four centuries of wood cutting to fuel sugar refinement processes, uh, we have several examples of um, deforestation. Um, uh, secondly, uh, sugar, cotton and mulberry trees are all water-intensive um, cultivations. Uh, and in the cases of sugar, actually, uh, this, is, this condition is exacerbated by the fact that water is necessary to power the mills that ground the sugar cane. So it's not just about watering the plants, but also proce the processing uh, into the refinement process. Um, now, this image here doesn't really look like, like the Nile or the Yangtze River, where we would think water-intensive cultivations. Um, and the immediate question is how are these cultivations sustainable in the semi-arid, dry landscape of Cyprus? Um, of course, uh, climate and environment are not static. And here, the Little Ice Age and its manifestation in the Mediterranean uh, has an answer. Uh, what this means is that you, from, the, uh, from the 16th until the 19th century, we have this climatic phenomenon uh, whereby there is higher precipitation, uh, more snow, and periodic droughts. Um, there is a variety of evidence uh, proving the presence of the Little Ice Age in, in Cyprus. I will only mention some aspects of it now, but I'd be happy to elaborate um, later. So here we have some examples of extreme weather phenomena uh, in Ottoman Cyprus, and I would like to draw your attention to droughts in the 18th century. Uh, here we have uh, seven instances of recorded uh, droughts in all available sources, uh, only one of which lasted for two consecutive years. Uh, in the 20th century, we have 18 cases, 18 years of drought, most of which were consecutive. So we see this dramatic difference to a present-day uh, climate, which partly explains um, what is, uh, what is uh, happening with the Little Ice Age. Now, moving on, on a different level, what about Baudel's famous Mediterranean trinity of cereals, olives, and vines? 
Uh, well, what we have here is that the distribution and density of these crops naturally varies in different islands and kinds of spaces. Um, it's interesting to see the different choices that Cypriots and Cretans make in the organization of their agricultural production. Uh, Crete chose the high monetary revenue of olive oil and wine over the sustenance security of grain. Uh, Cyprus, on the other hand, had an export-oriented grain production, um, which uh, meant that essentially the island in the 18th, in the late 18th century, the island suffered greatly because of hoarding and market manipulations. Uh, as far as the other uh, Trinity goods are concerned, olives were mainly for internal consumption. It wasn't really an export-oriented good, whereas vines were spatially concentrated uh, in the more mountainous areas of the island and did not play a major role in the economy of the island as a whole. Uh, however, what we can conclude here is that both islands have a cash crop economy, albeit with very, very different kinds of crops. Uh, and this is very eloquently described uh, by a, a 17th century observer, uh, perhaps an early Brodelian observer of the Mediterranean, who wrote... Quote, the three isles of Cyprus, Candy, that is Crete, and Sicily are the only monarchal queens of the Mediterranean seas, and semblable to other in fertility, length, breadth, and circuit, save only that Candy is somewhat more narrow than the other two, and also more hilly and sassiness. Yet for oils and wines, she is the mother of both the other. Sicily being for grain and silks the empress of all, and Cyprus for sugar and cotton wool a darling sister to both. Only Sicily being the most civil island nobly gentilitate, the Cypriots indifferently good, and the Candiots the most rubid of all. End quote. Now, how do these large-scale, long dura processes translate on the ground? Uh, I'll bring you one example um, from a historical actor illustrating the political economy of perceived uh, space. And it's the, uh, the governor, the Muhassil Haji Abdul Bakia, that I mentioned before. Uh, he was a Cypriot of humble background, illiterate and one eyed, who managed to reach the top of the local administration and enjoy the active patronage of the Grand Vizier and the Sheikh Ul Islam. Uh, so here we have a very impressive case of social uh, mobility. Uh, here we have a collective petition by the Islamic scholars and the Muslim notables of Cyprus uh, against uh, Abdul Baki, uh, accusing him of various uh, transgressions. And uh, this petition leads, uh, lists no less than 25 accusations, most of which are much more imaginative than the usual uh, accus uh, formulations of oppression and transgression that one finds in uh, Ottoman um, documents. So let's look at some of them. Uh, one was coercing people to sell their products at cheap prices, uh, appropriating cotton, silk, donkeys, inheritances, as well as forcibly taking money as loan repayments by producing false witnesses uh, at court, uh, exporting grain to Europe during times of scarcity, thus driving prices up, uh, diverting the water supply of the Selimi Yevakov fountain in the center of Nicosia to his own farms, thus starving the city of water, including five and six year old children in the registers in order to reduce the per capita rate of taxation, demolishing the houses of those unable to pay taxes uh, and taking the timber as payment, uh, forcing the writing of false petition to his defense and forging an ilam, um, um, a document stating that complaints against him were slanders by stealing the stamps of court officials mm -hmm. uh, and causing, finally causing the divorce of married women by producing false witnesses <laughs> and taking them under his custody. Now, most of these are examples of how Abdul Baki interacts with perceived space and how he is able to exert a significant degree of control and influence over the economy by manipulating the big enough, small enough, and far enough principle. 
Now, moving on to conceived space, which concerns the vision and intentions of experts and officials for public space, uh, architects, civil engineers, municipal authorities, etc. This is how Lefebvre uh, understands uh, conceived space. I substitute this with the bureaucratic vision over and administrative position of Cyprus as a province of the Ottoman Empire. So how did state bureaucrats and decision makers envision and try to situate Cyprus in and as a constituent part of imperial, imperial order? Uh, prior to 15, prior to the conquest, uh, Cyprus had a tributary status. Uh, when it was under uh, Venice, um, the Ottomans received this tributary payment that they inherited from the Mamluks, uh, and the Ottomans felt comfortable enough to <coughs> demand the dispatch of hunting falcons uh, addressing Venetian authorities, rather like Ottoman functionaries. And this is what Vera Constantini described as a spatial imagination that saw Cyprus as an extension of Anatolia. Uh, indeed, in 1571, immediately after the conquest, the, isle, the island was uh, attributed the status, the administrative status of a Beylair Bay, the biggest possible administrative unit. Um, and southeast Anatolia and northwest Syria were connected to the island uh, in this administrative unit, therefore attach, the, therefore the island draws the mainland to it. Um, this is uh, what Hagen, when he was describing, uh, discussing uh, Katip Chalabi, uh, a contemporary Ottoman geographer uh, who was describing this arrangement, uh, Gottfried Hagen points out that there, here we have a discrepancy between geography and administration. Uh, the Ottomans quickly found out that Cyprus was desirable uh, as long as the enemy had it for reasons of piracy and whatnot. Uh, once the Ottomans acquired it, they didn't quite know what to do with it. Um, you can, this is evident, for example, by the fact that there is really a token garrison on the island. And this is rather similar to what the British found out after they, um, they, they took the island. Uh, they kept uh, little, uh, something like a, a company and a half of men uh, prior to the 1950s. Um, on, on another level, uh, the main products of Cyprus, lucrative as they may have been for local entrepreneurs, uh, they were also available in the adjacent region. Therefore, from an empire-wide view, it wasn't anything that stood out. Uh, indeed, uh, to the north of Cyprus, we had Anatolia, to the south, Egypt, and to the east, Syria, uh, right between the empire's core and two more autonomous regions. To its west, late Crete, the western frontier of the island, of the empire. Uh, Cyprus, of course, was no frontier. It never had that status. And it stood at the proverbial arm's length. Uh, as uh, Marius once uh, said uh, over some drinks, uh, Cyprus was in between, on the way to somewhere. Uh, it was an island that rarely captured the attention of Istanbul-based policymakers. A sense of ambiguity in the Ottoman bureaucratic mind. Uh, administrative change only came as a response to socio-economic exigencies. This attention, however, is sporadic and was never sustained enough. As a result, the same problems keep on recurring. Uh, we can see this with the different changes of administrative position uh, Cyprus experienced. Um, uh, suffice to say that throughout the uh, 18th century, over a period of 78 years, we have 11 instances of administrative change. And I want to draw your attention here, uh, one, to the fact that uh, Cyprus is acknowledged as, as uh, it has the special status that draws the mainland to it that I described before, immediately after the conquest. Uh, but when it becomes part of the uh, province of the archipelago, it was, it's under the administration of the, imp of the imperial admiral, uh, it is not part of the province of the archipelago. So it has this ambiguous relationship to the maritime administrative provinces of the empire, as if it's not quite an island. Um, now, how did Ottoman bureaucrats describe Cyprus in their own 
uh, words. Well, this, what you see here, is the most uh, explicit exposition of what Cyprus looked like from a clerk's office in Istanbul, and it went something like this. Cyprus, like Crete and the other islands, is a vast island with extensive circumference. Now, uh, this is a formulation that came as a preamble of uh, an imperial order uh, sanctioning the change of the administrative status of the island uh, because of socio-economic exigencies. Um, and obviously the, uh, this uh, clerk felt that he had to justify somehow uh, this sudden attention to Cyprus. But why did he state the obvious? Uh, did he have nothing better to say? Is this statement the most clear-cut uh, attribute of Cyprus for our um, clerk? And then the other, uh, the, the rest of the sentence, like Crete and which islands that are vast with extensive circumference? Is this some sort of an early Brodellian Ottoman understanding of miniature uh, continents? Uh, these are questions that we don't really have an answer to. These are things that mean everything and nothing, and it's difficult to make sense of this. Um, formulation. Uh, however, I want to point out that it may seem that the above mentioned Ottoman uh, clerk lacked in imagination while describing Cyprus. Uh, nevertheless, the British did not lag behind in that respect. A colonial film produced in the 1940s when London was trying to rationalize and justify its presence on the island during World War II carried an equally clumsy stating the obvious title. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what can we uh, say uh, more about, about conceived space? Uh, if Ottoman sources do not really explicate a tangible vision for Cyprus, what they, uh, what the, does it, they don't really clarify what the island meant for them. Uh, this is not surprising. This is the nature of Ottoman documentation. Anyone familiar with Ottoman documents uh, is not surprised. These vagaries are, are rather common. So what can we learn uh, from the patterns of practice that, we, uh, are, that are discernible in pertinent documentation? Uh, well, the most voluminous category of records in the Istanbul archives concern exiles or imprisonments. Um, from the Cadiz Adelis to Nami Kemal, many an Ottoman undesirable were sent to Cyprus to be silenced. At the collective level, we have periodic settlements uh, or, uh, of, of uh, various populations which actually uh, go back to their places of origin. They don't want to stay there for some reason. Um, and anyone seeking references to Cyprus in the narratives of Ottoman historians is confronted with case after case of, punit of banishment or punitive appointment. It would be no exaggeration to state that this was the most consistent use that the Ottomans made of Cyprus throughout their rule. So maybe we're talking about an Ottoman Australia in the Mediterranean. Who knows? Um, this should raise few eyebrows. Islands are ideal places of exile. We have the example of Rhodes, uh, Limnos, etc. And of course, prior to the Ottomans, the Venetians also utilized the island as a space for the removal of undesirables of one sort or another. Uh, in this instance, uh, we have again a we have a similar situation with the British and the Venetians, uh, and we have a, a British observer commenting, quote, Cyprus had become a kind of a dust heap from Africa, where people who had either defects in their characters or their minds were sent after service there, end quote. Now, moving on to lived uh, space. Uh, what we have here is how local actors project and represent their identities, experiences, local conditions, or interactions with space in their engagement with authority, uh, be it in Istanbul, London, Marseille, or Venice. Here we have state, quasi-state, or non-state agents, consuls, merchants, dragomans, petition-writing subjects, or various recipients of imperial authority. Um, here, uh, I want to discuss a little bit how space becomes a means of negotiation from below, how Cypriot 
taxpayers are transcending physical realities in their engagement with the Ottoman um, state. Um, the threat of emigration is a well-known weapon of the week, uh, employed by petitioning subjects uh, in complaining about high taxation or the transgressions of state corrupt or corrupt state officials. Uh, what we have here, however, is peasant fl flight becoming a fait accompli. This is a rare occurrence in Ottoman documentation, I need to emphasize. And Cyprus move en masse across the sea to the Chukurva region of Anatolia and Syria. This means that taxes cannot be collected, and the Ottoman state quickly tries to remedy the situation. So uh, they send instructions to state functionaries in the regions where Cypriots went, and they tell them to find them and tell them uh, that if they return to their former homelands, they will receive tax breaks for two, three, or five years, while the administrative status or is, will be changed in response to this socio-economic exigency. And indeed, the document we saw earlier in 1721 was one such instance. And of course, what happens is that the peasants return. And this, I need to emphasize, is no isolated incident. This is something that happens eight times throughout the 18th century. The ease with which Cypriots can cross the sea uh, becomes a lever in negotiating with the Ottoman state, informing, uh, informing it of serious socio-economic tensions and the need for administrative change. Now, we've uh, seen so far the three kinds of space, uh, co uh, perceived, conceived, and lived uh, space. But I emphasized earlier the importance of context for insularity. Uh, so let me return to my title, Insularity and Empire, and see what empire really means here. Uh, and the question we need to ask is, what kind of empire? How does imperial context interact with and shape an insularity? In the case of Venice, uh, Cyprus is the easternmost limit of the Stado Damar. And we can see from the map here that we have an interconnected uh, chain of ports um, and islands leading to uh, the east, to the lucrative trade uh, with uh, Damascus uh, and, and uh, further east. Uh, it's no surprise that some modern observers described Cyprus as, quote, a widely spaced and weighty pendant uh, well, that was at the end of a series of clusters of islands and ports. A, uh, Cyprus, uh, in addition, was a source of, a major source of wheat, especially uh, after Sicilian grain became less accessible. It was a supplier of sugar uh, to Europe and a producer of, of cotton. Uh, therefore, Venice was acutely aware of the need to protect and invest in uh, the island. If Cyprus was part of the Venetian chain of islands and ports, under the Ottomans, it was subsumed in a unified land and sea mass. Therefore, anything of extraordinary economic, political, or geostrategic value was ephemeral at best. It could be found in the surrounding region, um, and this was a situation that was very much like what the British experienced, uh, who only saw geostrategic value to the island right before they acquired it and right, uh, sorry, right before they acquired it and right before they lost it. Now, how can we sum up the Cypriot insularity? It was a microcosm of the Ottoman Empire. It shows little deviation from the, from the grand scheme of things. Of things. Every single fiscal and administrative system had been applied there. The features of local agriculture, uh, manufacturing or finance do not diverge, diverge from Ottoman economic trends. The feature, um, Cyprus follows the ebbs and flows of imperial fortunes, and larger Ottoman as well as Mediterranean-wide processes are reflected on the island. Phenomena encountered in Cyprus are neither exclusive nor extraordinary. And inquiring into their manifestation with reference to the spatial allows a different appreciation of the scale, quality, intensity, and combination of historical circumstances. I would sum it up as an ambiguous insularity, perhaps a cross between a peninsula and an island. How can we put this in a bigger Mediterranean context? 
First of all, insularity is not a generic notion. Not islands are the same, obviously. Uh, the question here is not so much the degree of an island's insularity, but rather the kind of insularity it carries at any given point in time and temporal context. So this is less about quantity and more about quality. If we want to uh, look at bigger debates about the unity or division of the Mediterranean, we have Piran, Brodel, Goitain and Tabak adopting a macrospatial, uh, inquiring into the macrospatial economic unity of the Mediterranean. Uh, on the other hand, Horden and Parso uh, adopt a more micro-regional focus. They talked about unity in diversity. Uh, the most uh, recent uh, contribution to discussions about the unity or division of the Mediterranean is Jessica Goldberg's Trade and Institution in the Medieval Mediterranean, who proposes meso-regional links and dynamics. Um, the insularity of miniature continents, therefore, is a concept that is particularly conducive to this sort of medium-scale regional study. Now, um, I want to say a few things about my current project. Um, what I've explained so far was my uh, more conceptual engagement with insularity uh, on the basis of my doctoral research. Um, this is the research I'm undertaking now with a project called Mediterranean Insularities, Space, Landscape and Agriculture in Early Modern Cyprus and Crete. Uh, the project looks at the initial tax surveys of the two islands in 1572 and 1607. Um, I process the data with geographic information systems, software and digital cartographic tools. Uh, really, these are two fiscal snapshots of the countrysides of the two islands, set against the backdrops of the rural landscape, geomorphology and climate and environment. What we have here is perceived space at the micro level. We look at village after village, what they produce and how the environment around it uh, is related to uh, those choices. I'm trying to make those concepts more tangible by exploring the articulation of material conditions in the spatial setting of an island. How does this look like? This is a page from the uh, Cyprus uh, register. Um, each, this is the village of Sotira in the province of Famagusta. Uh, each village is given geographical uh, coordinates uh, and then uh, geo, so we, we uh, attribute a, a um, uh, we situate that on a map uh, and geolocation is then correlated with GIS data on elevation, uh, gradient, soil type, proximity and access to water resources etc. This allows us to ask whether production patterns of the time uh, in each village or region is justified by present-day environmental um, characteristics. To make this uh, more concrete, the picture of the sugar mills uh, in the site that you saw earlier in Kuklia uh, is not... Uh, is, is, um, the present-day landscape doesn't justify the cultivation of uh, sugar cane. Um, and it doesn't account for the fact that it was a major sugar plantation if we look at present-day landscape. Therefore, we have a major change happening over uh, five centuries. Uh, and finally, uh, we can ask the question of what can we learn about the choices of cultivating one crop over another through this kind of inquiry. Uh, the data is extracted from the register and it's entered into a, an Excel sheet. Uh, we have in total 1,137 villages and uh, settlements, uh, and then uh, 66 categories of taxable products, monetary taxes, dues, or fines. Um, what does it look like on a map? Uh, here uh, we uh, are looking at the spatial distribution of wheat production in Cyprus in 1572. Uh, the, the blank spot on the west side of the island I haven't processed yet. This is why it's empty. Uh, so basically you can see that grain is ubiquitous. Uh, it's, it's almost everywhere. Uh, a very different picture emerges if we look at cotton, uh, which confirms the hypothesis that uh, the, the, no, hypothesis, the qualitative 
impression uh, that I mentioned earlier that it doesn't, it doesn't become prolific until the 17th century. Indeed, in the 16th century it's highly concentrated and we don't see m uh, major uh, fluctuations in, in its uh, cultivation. Uh, when we look at uh, flags, again something very interesting emerges. Uh, this is an unexpected, if logical, find that is uh, flax is pretty much everywhere and this makes perfect sense because cotton is just about on the rise, it's not quite uh, prolific yet uh, in the 16th century and therefore clothing needs are covered by flax. Um, <clears throat> again uh, when we look at wine uh, we see what I mentioned before uh, that there is a high concentration in the more mountainous areas of the island uh, which is uh, in, in, in Limassol to those of you familiar with the um, geography um, uh, that is uh, no surprise really and here is another example of what we can do uh, with uh, maps this time with historical maps um, and this is um, the first modern map of Cyprus compiled by um, uh, Kitchener, the Lord Kitchener, um, who uh, composed this map uh, in a scale of 1 to 2,500. It's extremely uh, detailed. And what we can do by geo-referencing this map is extract any piece of information that we have on it. And what I've done is I try to uh, measure and visualize green space and categorize green space across the city of Nicosia inside um, the walls. And for those of you familiar with Nicosia, this is a very uh, weird picture. What we have here really is a garden city, which is very, very different to the built environment that we experience today. More importantly, what we can do, because Kitchener... Uh, got into the trouble of mapping all the wells, conduits um, and uh, tanks, water tanks of Nicosia, we can correlate all these green spaces, orchards and uh, gardens, we can correlate them and see how uh, water management uh, systems were uh, used and regulated. Finally, I want to say a few things about what this research builds towards. Uh, what, uh, the, uh, what the special humanities allow us to do uh, with uh, this kind of historical analysis. One project I'm involved in is the Digital Ottoman Platform at the Institute of Advanced Study, for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, this is an international collaborative project consolidating digital humanities resources in Ottoman studies. Uh, we've already divided into uh, groups and started working. The first uh, workshop was last June and we have one more forthcoming uh, this year. Uh, another project I'm involved in is uh, the title is Mapping Economic Space in the Ottoman World. Uh, this is in, with, in collaboration with Elias Kolovos, a colleague at the University of Crete and the Institute for Mediterranean uh, Studies. What we do here is uh, we expand the methodology of Mediterranean insularities uh, as far as fiscal registers are concerned and we try to do it for other Ottoman uh, provinces hoping at some point to cover uh, or uh, aspiring at some point to cover the whole um, of the empire and further explore the pre and post Ottoman spatio-economic structures. Uh, finally Another project I have with Ali Yaijioglu uh, of uh, Stanford. Um, we are working on um, uh, visualizing the uh, realms of Tebedelenli Ali Pasha of Yanina, uh, the so-called uh, Muslim Bonaparte. Uh, what we're trying to do is through different uh, kinds of sources, particularly his own correspondence, we try to see the kind of relationships he forges with different uh, individual or collective agents, villagers, um, uh, different associates he had, uh, big farms, uh, and uh, all the kind of spatial relationships that he forms. Um, I hope I was able to illustrate how the spatial humanities open up new methodological and analytical horizons and what this means in Ottoman and Mediterranean studies.
Thank you.